As we said earlier, there are plans in the works right now for Muhammad Ali's funeral, which will take place in his hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. And the city's mayor is ordering flags at all city government buildings to be lowered to half staff. ABC's Ryan Smith is in Louisville outside the Muhammad Ali Center with more on Ali's childhood and how he got into boxing. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Dan and Paula. Well, all night long, people have been stopping by this Muhammad Ali Center created with his values in mind, a museum just for him with his values, and they've been remembering their star, their hometown hero. People have been leaving signs, flowers, saying prayers for the family, remembering the moments that Muhammad Ali touched their lives. As you mentioned, here in the city center of government in Louisville, they're going to be lowering the flags to have staff, and they will remain there until Muhammad Ali is laid to rest. But this was his hometown. This was his home, the place he identified most closely with and the place where he is a star and a legend. In so many ways, people talked about all the experiences they've had with him, seeing him over the years. But not only that, this is where he got his start in boxing. At 12 years old, another young man in the community stole his bike. He went to report it to a police officer, and that police officer, sensing that Muhammad Ali wanted to start a fight, said, hey, why don't you come down and train in my gym? Just six years later, he became an Olympic gold medalist. And 10 years later, at age 22, heavyweight champion of the world. But while his boxing exploits were incredible, so many here talking about his impact outside the ring as what made him a legend. His humanitarian efforts, his outgoing personality, but almost more than anything, his ability to speak his mind no matter what the cost, earning him respect worldwide, making him one of the most recognizable faces and making him one of the most respectable human beings of his time. So many people today mourning the loss, but celebrating Muhammad Ali, saying his legend will live on, especially right here in this city. Again, his funeral is expected to take place here. He was expected to be laid to rest here. And we're going to learn more about his funeral announcements later this morning, Dan and Paula. Ryan, thank you. Let's bring in John Ramsey now. John is a man who's been friends with Muhammad Ali for more than three decades. And he was with him during some of his final hours there in Arizona. John, we do want to thank you for joining us this morning. And for, uh, thank you for having me. Good morning to both of you. Good morning to you. First and foremost, can you tell us what it's been like there at the hospital over the last few days with friends and family? You know, it was a, a mixture of emotions. There were a lot of hugs. There were a lot of tears, a lot of old stories. I think um, the family and his wife, Lonnie, find a lot of comfort in their spirituality. Uh, but it, it, was a, it was a tough night, no question about it. Uh, hearts are heavy, and I know that doesn't just include myself or the family. Uh, hearts are heavy around the world. That is right. And John, uh, did he try to communicate anything in these last days? You know, Muhammad was able to communicate the way Muhammad communicates, which is, you know, uh, via his eyes, via his actions, via his smile. Um, you know, he still had that charisma. You, there's nothing like that. Muhammad Ali magic. And that always existed all the way to the very end. So, um, you know, uh, Muhammad went out with dignity. As I said, uh, the prayers were heard and certainly appreciated. You said he went out with dignity, he was able to communicate with his eyes, but did he seem to be at peace with, with how things were going in the hospital? Did he seem to be at peace with his life and what was happening? You, you know, only, only uh, Muhammad and uh, the big man upstairs would be able to answer that question. Uh, the, the time in the hospital room alone with Muhammad was spent with the family and the family alone, and I respected that. There was a small group of close friends with them there in the waiting room, but as far as that you know, the one-on-one -on -one interaction at the very end was reserved for family members only, and certainly I think everyone can understand that, and I respect that. Absolutely. You, you've known him for 35 years by our account. I'm just curious, are, are there moments that stand out most clearly in your mind this morning? You know, as, as my relationship with Muhammad evolved, it became less and less about what he did in the ring, which was the uh, initial allure, and became more and more what he did out of the ring. You know, um, Muhammad the compassion, the kindness. You know, he was a once in a lifetime, not just a once in a lifetime kind of athlete, he was a once in a lifetime kind of person. And, you know, it wasn't just about autographs and kissing babies and all of that. You know, if, it, if there was a child who was hungry in a third world country, Muhammad was on a plane with a check in hand. Mm -hmm. If there was a conflict he could help resolve, Muhammad was traveling. He, he was a guy, he was a man of action. And I, I think that's what impressed me most about Muhammad. Usually, not just with athletes, but you can, you can follow the money. With mm -hmm. Muhammad, it was always follow the heart. 
John, I want to ask you real quickly. You know, he, he went over to, to Rome and won the gold medal at age 18, the Olympic medal. He came back to Louisville and threw that medal in the Ohio River. Does he ever regret throwing it into the river? And he did that because of, of segregation reasons. No, I, you know, I, I've talked with Tom, to Muhammad about that a number of times. Yeah, he wasn't allowed in a restaurant. And he thought, you know, I represented my country, and yet I can't be served in my own hometown. So again, Muhammad was a vehicle of change and, and a man of action. So I think that was symbolic of, you know, we need some change in this country. Certainly Muhammad led that charge with the civil rights movement. And uh, no, I don't think he regretted it at all. He was glad to get a, a replacement medal at the Olympics <laughs> in Atlanta. But with that being said, I think he knew that was his destiny. Doesn't seem like a man with many regrets. John Ramsey, we really appreciate having you on on this morning. Thank you very much. Longtime friend of yeah. Muhammad Ali, John Ramsey. We also want to bring in now ABC News and ESPN contributor LZ Granderson. LZ, good morning. Um, Muhammad Ali is now, as, as the New York Times called him this morning, something of a secular saint. But as we've discussed, in the 1960s, he was really controversial. So in your view, how did he go from a polarizing figure to this beloved legend? Well, time and distance heals a lot of wounds. Uh, we've seen countless so-called controversial figures who fought for things mm -hmm. that were controversial in the past, and then over time, uh, as we've seen our errors as a nation, we begin to see they were actually more enlightened than the nation was at that particular time, and they become beloved heroes. You know, we remember when Nelson Mandela passed away, he was boiled down to a lot of inspirational quotes. But what we forgot to talk about was the fact that he was actually on the U.S. terrorist list and that he was seen as not as someone as beloved, but as someone who was very, very hostile to the U.S. interests. But with time and reflection, we were able to see that he was actually fighting for something greater. And that's also true for Muhammad Ali. You mentioned Nelson Mandela, but in the world of, of athletics, he was really the first African-American athlete. I mean, you have Jackie Robinson, but the first one to become a truly global superstar. So what did that mean to the community? You know, it's really interesting that you would bring up Jackie Robinson because Jackie Robinson uh, aligned himself with other Christians who were fighting for civil rights movement. And Muhammad Ali aligned himself up with the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X, who was not fully embraced by the entire African-American community. And Jackie Robinson actually publicly had criticized um, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali at times because they felt as if the Nation of Islam was a hindrance to the civil rights movement. So it's really interesting that, that you, you would bring up his name. But you're, you're absolutely right. He was uh, the first truly global icon in large part because he brought his sport and he brought the, the entertainment factor of his sport to so many countries around the world. And they got a chance to see someone who while brash, was still somewhat approachable and, 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 and comical. So even though some people have been put off by his uh, seemingly lack of humbleness <laughs> in terms of his craft, the simple fact that he was so engaging, he was attractive, and he was the best, uh, made him really hard to resist for a lot of people. Couldn't take our eyes off him, no question about it. LZ, such a pleasure to have you on this morning. Thank you. And I want to remind everybody, we're going to have much more on Muhammad Ali coming up right here on GMA. And there will also be a special edition of 2020, a tribute to the champ, tonight at 8 o'clock, also right here on ABC. Yeah, as LZ just said, he was pretty much irresistible, wasn't Absolutely. he?